This week on The Whitney Reynolds Show, we're talking about powerful women in the workplace. Stay tuned to find out how these women entrepreneurs are changing the world. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you, and the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live. Today on The Whitney Reynolds Show, we're talking with women who know what they want and aren't afraid to go after it. Women entrepreneurs are setting examples for young girls all over the world, and we're getting an inside look on how they got to where they are today. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. Today we have with us Paula Kerger, the Chief Executive Officer and President of PBS. She is also the President of the PBS Foundation and is going to explain what it looks like to be a woman in corporate business. It is so great to have you here because this is a new aspect to the Woman Entrepreneur Show because you really are corporate. Tell mm -hmm. us what it's like to be a CEO. Give us a glimpse into your life. Well, obviously, I didn't grow up thinking, oh, I'm going to be a CEO when I get older. Actually, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. But I, um, you know, as I have gone through my career and, um, you know, explored different things, you know, I think for some people, CEO ends up being a, um, a place where one finally arrives. And I talked to a lot of young women and I explained to them, it's not for everybody. You know, it's, um, you know, you have to be comfortable making difficult decisions. You have to be comfortable knowing that you are where the buck stops. And you, it's sometimes a lonely place to be, but it's also an extraordinary place to be. So going back to what you said, you originally thought you might be a veterinarian. What shifted? Was it something like becoming, in, growing into yourself as you oh, got? Oh no, it was organic chemistry. Oh. I was uh, taking <laughs> oh, a wait. lot of science <laughs> courses in college. It really was organic. I, oh, it was organic chemistry. Organic <laughs> chemistry came. We didn't see eye to eye, and suddenly I was uh, reevaluating my life choices. And uh, what I ended up doing, I took some liberal arts classes because I was interested and then panicked. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'll never be gainfully employed. And I got a business degree, but with no real notion of where I was headed. Um, I, when I graduated, I had been working at a bank, and so I had some opportunities there. But I knew that's not what I wanted to do. And really, it was serendipity. I got a job in the nonprofit sector. And it was kismet. It was a perfect fit for me. I've been in the nonprofit sector my entire life. And I really love working in organizations where I feel that I'm perhaps contributing even a tiny bit to making the world a better place. Well, and PBS definitely does that. So when did you start with PBS? Take us back to your early days. You obviously didn't walk in and just say, I'm here, no. ready for this. <laughs> yeah, so. No, it usually doesn't work <laughs> out like that. So I, uh, I first got involved in public broadcasting um, with the station in New York. And I, I went there to uh, really help them raise money. I had all my early work in the nonprofit uh, industry was in uh, fundraising. And so that's the door that I came in. Uh, and I helped them do a big capital campaign. And, and, but it was, a, it was an entree into an entire new world for me. I'd never worked in media. I certainly um, um, hadn't really thought about that as a, as a career path at all. Uh, and the president of the organization, after, uh, after some period of time, we finished a very big capital campaign, asked me if I would consider becoming station manager because I was working a lot on the strategic direction of the, of the organization. And, and it sort of grew organically. I was there. I was the COO and station manager. And from there, I got the, a call one day asking me if I would be interested in running PBS. My answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be an interesting call to no, get. No, I like, said no. I really, I love what I'm doing. I love being in New York. I thought I had a career path all, already worked out that I, I would, you know, perhaps uh, become the president. Um, but, um, but I was persuaded to uh, to talk to the search committee, and that I think is an important message that I also try to share with others is that 
when someone comes knocking, you, your first answer should probably not, not be no. <laughs> you should at least take a pause and think about it. That's a good and one. And so I, I, I agreed to meet with the search committee. And, um, and in the process of that discussion, you have to, I think, when you interview for a job, particularly a job at that level, you have to put yourself in the job. You have to imagine what it would be like to do it. And I had spent a lot of time thinking about what I thought was going to be important nationally. And after that first interview, I realized that actually this was what I was meant to do. So, Did you have a hard time when you first stepped into that role? Because you had, you know, you, you naturally are a leader. I don't feel like leaders are just born overnight. You probably had leadership qualities ever since you were a kiddo. But then you step in. Was it hard to be like one position and then advance, which like you said it's, is natural. It's a big leap. And actually, I'd had the experience when I was at um, WNET in New York because I had been in one role and then suddenly I was in charge running uh, the station with a lot of people reporting to me who had been my peers. And so I had that experience of moving into a leadership position. But I have to say, and as I look back as a first time CEO, it was there were surprises. And I had a really tremendous mentor who was the chairman of the board, who was very interested, a woman by the way, who was very interested and uh, recognized that my success was really her success and that um, we were in this together. And she had led the search. And so a lot of organizations, I think, sometimes go through a whole search process. And when someone's hired, it's like, OK, we're done. Now right. we can move on and they can go to their work. But she stayed very close to me and made sure that I got the support that I needed, sometimes on issues that where I sought her advice and sometimes where I didn't necessarily see where there might be challenges. And she anticipated some of that and helped me make that transition. But you know, I think when you look at a job like a uh, CEO kind of role, you anticipate, I think, some of what you'll experience. But you know, there are surprises. You do realize that you, know, you suddenly look around and realize that you don't necessarily have a network of people around you like you do when you're in a different level in an organization where you can go for advice and counsel in the same way. Right. Oh my goodness. So many good things to take away from this. I hope our viewers have their little notepad at home because there's so many things. But I love what you said about the mentor because that always helps. And then making sure that mentor not only holds you accountable, but you hold them accountable right. to keep on you know, sowing their seeds. So Mentoring, I think, is really, and when people come to me for advice about you know, how to manage career, the, the, the biggest piece of advice I give is look for someone to learn from. I still do. I still have challenges, and I look for people that um, have had this, have had similar experiences because I know that you know people are generous; they yeah. want to share, and I, I think it's it's rewarding on both sides. I love mentoring uh, people as well. I think we owe it; you know, you you pay it back, right? Love it. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Whitney. For our social sizzle today, we are delighted to have Candace Jordan with us. She's a media personality and writer for the Chicago Tribune's Candid Candace. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Whitney. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, so today's show is Women Entrepreneurs, and what I love about the show is that we get a unique group every year. And what I love about you is you're not just writing for the paper. You have a TV show. You do everything around Chicago, I think, known to woman. Well, you know, you have to spin all the plates at all times, you know, in this day and age. And so, yeah, I do a lot. But, you know, I'm blessed with very high energy. And I always tell this story about my mother, who well into her 80s, was the last person to ever leave a party. You'd have to get a hook for my mother to leave. And I'm sure it's genetic, because I'm exactly the same. Well, I was going to say that sounds very similar to someone I know. <laughs> so tell us about when you started the Candid Candace Comp. Yeah, well, you know, Candid Candace derived from my Playboy Centerfold. I mean, that's the name that they called me. That was the name that was in the layout. And so when I came to Chicago and started writing, um, I thought that's a perfect name because so many people across the country already, already knew me by that. And so that's kind of that's how it came about, and kind of case, organically. And in case our viewers don't understand, because they probably just heard Playboy and they were like, "What <laughs> is going on?" So the Playboy centerfold. So you were actually yeah, one of the I bunnies. was a centerfold in December '79. I started as a Playboy bunny in St. Louis. I transferred to the club in Chicago when Hef, into the mansion when Hef was in residence. I became a bunny in Chicago. I was bunny of the year in 76. And uh, you know, I've been with Playboy. Actually, I'm still with Playboy. I mean, I'm still a part of that family. We still you know, go out to the mansion for the parties and see Hef. He's a little older now. He's gonna be 90 next year. 
But, uh, you know, he's still all there, and, uh, yeah, the Playboy's been really good to me. How did you transition your career from going to be, from being a bunny to now being, like, a well-known rider in Chicago? Well, you know, I started actually at, at age 13 as a model in St. Louis, so I've been modeling all my life. And uh, when I came to Chicago, after I did the Playboy bunny stint, the art director said, Candace, you should go back to what, you know, you were doing before, which was modeling, because I'd really done everything I could do at Playboy. And so they created my comp here in Chicago. Um, I took it around. I went to New York. I was with Wilhelmina in New York. I modeled in Europe. I had a billboard in Times Square. I was in Risky mm -hmm. Business with Tom Cruise. So the modeling career and the acting part of it really kind of branched off from there. So what's next for you? You know, that's a really good question. I feel like I've done everything I know, already. You really have. And you, know, you do I'm, it well, too. Well, thank you very much. And back at you. But, um, you know, it's like I always wait for the doors to open. Whatever door opens is the first one I go through. And it's really worked well up to this point. But uh, I'm right now, I mean, I love my internet show. I'd really like to grow that some more. Um, I've talked to every celebrity that I can imagine already, and, you know, that's thrilling. But, yeah, I don't know really right now what my next step's going to be. And I love my column. I love being out and about, you know, shining a light on Chicago charities. I mean, that really gives me great, great gratitude. But, um, yeah, so I just think I'm going to look for that other door. And, you know, I think when the time's right, things like that always happen. So part of this show is, like, a lot of women are, and men are tuning in, hoping to get a lot of advice out of today's show about how to grow their business. And so in that transitional phase for you, did you ever have moments of doubt, and how did you oh, conquer I that? Oh, I have moments of doubt 24-7. I mean, it's nothing. It never stops. Uh, there was somebody very famous, and I can't remember. Oh, I think it was Karl Lagerfeld. He said he's never satisfied, never satisfied with what he does. And I think that is the key to success, mm. because once you're satisfied, you become stagnant. Right. And so, you know, if you keep on wanting to grow yourself, grow your business, grow your ideas, I think that's what keeps you vibrant and alive and moving to that next step. So whenever you were making that transition, did the paper just come to you and say, we want you to start writing? Well, you know, it's, it's funny because I was writing for Today's Chicago Woman magazine, and I was their art director, the, their fashion editor. And so when they started their online column, they said, Candace, we'd like you to write a blog for the magazine. At that time, this was 2008, 2009, I didn't even know what a blog was. But I said, well, sure, I can write about what I'm doing. You know, I'll write about, you know, what nail polish I like. And, you know, so I just kind of wrote like that. And on the street, I'd be stopped with people that had read this online column, which just blew my mind. I thought, I can't believe people are reading what I'm <laughs> writing. But um, I kept at it. And eventually, when Chicago Now started, which is a branch of the Tribune, it's their blogging platform, the first, one of the first people they asked to join was me because I was covering that in the online column that I had and my blog that I had taken away separately. And so um, when I went in for the interview, they were changing the paper over. They wanted a social columnist. That's what, what I was good at, and I got hired. Would you say to the women out there and the men that um, following what you're good at is half the oh, success? Oh, it's 100 percent success. If, I mean, you ha cannot fit yourself around peg in a square hole. You have to follow what's your true what what your passion is. You know, because if you're passionate about something, you're going to put 100 percent effort into it, and that's going to grow it and make it successful. But if you're trying to do something that's really not you, you're not going to have the level of interest. You're not going to put your enthusiasm into it, and it's just not going to, quite frankly, be successful. Oh, what good advice! Yeah, you are. Are as social as they come. Thanks for coming on the social Thank sizzle. You, Whitney. Nice to see you. Congrats <laughs> yeah. on your show. Next on the show, we have Hillary Sawchuk, the CEO and founder of an online publication known as A Drink With, where she interviews celebrities and other individuals. She is a true example of owning an idea. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, when did you start A Drink With? Oh my gosh, I started four years ago. Um, I did go to school for broadcast journalism. And um, yeah, it was four years ago when I moved to the city. So what was it like graduating college and coming up with an idea called A Drink With and telling your parents, I'm gonna start a <laughs> business called A Drink With? You know, at the time, I did have some family members like curious how I was gonna turn it into a business, um, but no, they were supportive from the start. So how did you do that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people at home that are like, okay, how do you take an idea and one that's kind of out there, no offense, because I think it's a fabulous <laughs> idea and it's been proven successful, but how do you take an idea and actually make it into a business? Right. Well, it, I set small goals um, from the start. So it was just like, I want to post an interview once a week. And I was going up to people before there, the site was even up saying, I'm going to start this website to drink with. Will you sit down with me? And w people said yes. And it just kind of snowballed from there. So those mini goals of just getting one thing up, um, that's kind of how it 
start in the beginning. Were, is there any tricks of the trade of like getting backers behind you with an idea? Because you know that's that's half the battle. Right. I think um, you know I have a really great team that have, has been with me from the start: photographers and um, video production. And when it was, they believed so much in it that they were willing to start when I was self-funding this thing and doing it like on the weekends and after work and on my lunch break. Um, so yeah, I think it is important to have something that other people, and once I started to catch on, other people believed in it too, then I knew I really had something. <laughs> so walk us through what a drink with is. Sure, so we sit down and have a drink with anyone, it doesn't have to be a celebrity, anyone who has an inspiring success story. So whether it is an athlete, an artist, entrepreneur, we sit down and kind of get to know them as if they're a friend. So you sit them down, you have a, a conversation. How is this done um, on social media? So, okay, we have a photographer who takes candid shots of the conversation, a video production team, and then that's how we get, we've grown because of social media. So then we'll post, obviously, clips from the interviews online and, um, yeah, social media, oh my God. What advice would you give to other entrepreneurs? Uh, I th there, there are times when things happen and it seems like the end of the world, but it, you go through things for a reason. So no matter what happens, it might seem like everything's going wrong, like you're going through it for a reason. Um, and everything's a learning experience. That's what I ask all my interview subjects. I'm like, tell me about a time you failed. Yeah. And everyone from Richard Branson to Bethany Frankel, they all have their stories of the times that they fell down and how that was part of their success story. That is that's such an inspiration because I, all of us can probably think back to those times in our life and our oh career. You know, even today, I mean, I can't even think of a time I almost fell down today. You know, yeah. not literally, but I mean, it's one of those things that you got to take and learn from the experiences and grow. Mm -hmm. So, speaking of growing, where do you want to be? Oh my God! So worldwide, I think like we're doing these interviews in Chicago, um, but I want to be having drinks with people all over the world and sharing their stories. So. Well, what person wouldn't oh. want that? That is awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Now it's time for our viewer's voice, and this week we have decided to ask a new wave of social entrepreneurs a question that can help across the board in business. Today's question is, how did you gain a presence online, and are there tricks of the trade in creating a following? When I started thekitchen.com four years ago, my focus was creating consistent content that was all related to food so people knew that they could come back to my site and to my social followings every day for new food content. And then I really worked on interacting with anyone who was engaging with me. I answered questions, I posed questions to my readers, and I tried to get the interaction up as much as possible. And I also just worked on posting really consistently across social channels and posting different content. I would say my biggest piece of advice is to network as much as possible. Um, really use social for the means of what it's there for, and that is to be social on it. Post content that you find trending in the space, engage with people, make sure that you're commenting and liking on other people's content, and make sure that within the space you're truly and innately being social as well. Um, that's really the best way that you can help get your name out there and also to really grow your following and have it be genuine followers that are very interested in both you and your content that you're, that you're posting. Uh, when I started The Fox and She about four years ago, I mean, the whole landscape was totally different, but um, I'm a really visual person, so I spent a lot of time on Pinterest, and uh, thankfully, I somehow managed to gain quite a following there. So now, I have a really good following, and then having that following allows people to more people to see my content and share my content, so that's been a great way for me uh, to continually drive traffic, and I think one of the biggest things is having a unique voice and perspective. And having like a different, you know, kind of, we've talked about it with our friends all the time, like an image voice. And it's sort of like an image style. So when we created the Windy City Blogger Collective just over three years ago, we set out to create a community online for bloggers to be supportive of each other. And that's kind of a unique following and a unique group to be catering to because they're all influencers that are trying to make presences of their own. So we give a lot of advice, but a lot of the advice is the stuff that we follow on a day-to-day -day basis. So. We try to have a consistent message, we try to be positive, um, and it's kind of one of those like, if you're not gonna say something nice, don't say anything at all, and that's a good operating um, motto for all of your social media presences. 
As far as building a following, you just have to be consistent. You've got to know what you're talking about and it's okay for you to change your mind if it's a brand that's like personal. Last but not least, we have Lydia Bastianich who turned her love for cooking into several different business plans. She hosts the cooking show Lydia's Kitchen and is the author of best-selling cookbooks, a restaurant owner, and has teamed up with Italy. Let's take a look. I'm here with Lydia Bastianich. Now you are well known across the board. We're here at Italy in Chicago. And what I want you to talk about with the women is kind of how to develop a whole brand because I think that's one thing that's kind of missing these days is a lot of people do one thing or two things, but you do so many things well. Tell us what it's like developing your brand. Well, Whitney, first of all, you need to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. Really be informed in what you're doing, know your subject matter, have passion for it, and work very hard at it. Once you have initiated, once you have kind of made yourself known out there, it's a question of developing more and more, uh, if you will, customers or followers or people that believe in what you do. And uh, that means being out there and promoting, but you got to promote in the right way. You know, you got to sort of not just sell, 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 but be part of events, be part of a community, be part of, uh, do things also for others, and ultimately you're doing it for yourself. And the actual growth of the diversity, it's a slow process. As you have begun something and it is successful and you're good at it, then opportunities will come your way. The, the question is choosing the right opportunity and really making sure that you're competent, that you're capable of following through with that opportunity. I like what you said about that because sometimes you can get in over your head and you are one of those people that have not. You developed one brand really well and then it just kind of grew one on top of another. Now that you have cookbooks, you have, t I mean, people are probably like, okay, what is she doing on your show? She has her own show on PBS. You know, you've been so amazing. You're well known to the PBS world. But what is it that is your favorite? Would you say you have one favorite versus another or do you just do everything whenever it involves the culinary world well? Well, you know, uh, uh, Whitney, it's about food for me. It's cooking food, handling the product, and it's nurturing and feeding people. That's at the basis of what I do. And that permeates every other uh, sector that I took into it. If writing cookbooks, I wanted to make sure that in writing the cookbooks, it's not about what do I do great, but how can I teach the people out there? How can I empower them for them to become good cooks? And I make a real hard effort in doing just that, simple recipes that are workable, that are doable. Um, so, so, you know, cooking is at the base, television the same way, you know. When, when I teach, my, my lessons are about the viewers. They're not about me, what I can do. I can do certain things, but it's about how can I give, how can I empower the viewer? So you see, if, if, if something's gonna work for you, it has to be a two-way street. Your customer, your viewer, your reader has to get something out of it. Otherwise, you know, they're not just there in adoration of you. They are there for an exchange program. And so whenever you do something, when you get into something new, make sure that what you do really delivers something to the buyer, to the reader, to the watcher, to the chef, cook that cooks. One thing I love hearing about what you're saying is the empowering of others. I think sometimes people get lost in the shuffle because they think they focus solely on them, but really if you're doing a service or you have a business or you have, you know, whatever you do, if you think about the people that will be wanting to invest in your brand or believe in your brand, then that's really what you should look at. And it sounds like that's kind of what you're about. It is. You need to involve, get, get your customer, your potential customer, viewer, reader, whatever, to be part of you, to you have to sort of guarantee success for them too. When you can translate your success and make them successful in maybe a smaller way, they buy my pasta, they buy my sauces, they come home, they have the Lydia flavor. I give them instructions, they know they expect that. So you know, you make them a winner and that's what it's all about. So for, you know, you are well known when it comes to the kitchen. And so I have to ask you one question. We're going to stray away from the business success for the women out there. But tell us, when it comes to cooking, what is your one go-to recipe? Uh, well, I must say, you know, I love cooking seasonally, the product. And uh, again, I will say that product dictates what I cook. So when I have a great product, it's just a natural that I will 
try to do something with it. But if I come home at night late from work and uh, I feel like something, a plate of pasta and garlic and oil will do. Oh, I Good love it. Of wine, and I'm all set. I love it. Well, as I can see, we have your books here. We have your wine. We're at Italy, which you're like the face of Italy these days. Well, you know, it's a, a product that I believe very much. You know, I was lucky enough to be included in this, in this, this project and become a partner. And it's just so much fun. You know, when you know something, when you love something, at least I, I want to share it with somebody. So whether I share it in a book or in a restaurant or walking around Italy, I just have fun. I love it. And it's kind of communicating my message. It perpetuates itself. It continues to grow. Well, okay, so before we end this segment, what is it that you say at the end of all of your shows? Tutti a tavola a mangiare. Tutti a tavola a mangiare. You got that, guys? Okay, well, cheers to you. Thanks Salute. for coming on. Salute. Our guests this week have proven that a dream is possible to achieve. Each and every one of them has found something she loves to do and has made an incredible, successful career out of it. For more information on today's show or to share your success stories, visit us at WhitneyReynolds.com or on Twitter at Whitney Reynolds. Until next time. The Whitney Reynolds Show is supported by Volvo, designed around you, and the Respiratory Health Association, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Special thanks to the Autobarn Volvo of Oak Park, the Henry George School, and 27 Live.